Welcome, everybody, from around the world. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Finally warming up a little bit here, clouding overcast, but we're live with you. And as you saw on your screen, there is a huge, huge topic today. Is there salvation outside of the church? And so this is a delicate question. It affects all of us because of our friends and family and loved ones. You know, I've been telling you, and we've been taking you to seminary. I've been literally walking you through my seminary program with me. And that's why when you watch the videos that are already posted from the past, I did one on Jesus. So that was my Christology class. I did one on Mary. So that was my Maryology class. I did one on the angels. That was my angelology class. Today, we're doing one on the church. And the course I'm taking you in seminary today is ecclesiology. Ecclesiology, that means the church. And so very important that we hear what the church has to say. People might say, well, I don't care what the church says. We want to listen because Jesus, and I'll show you, delegated his complete authority to the church. So when the church speaks, it is Christ. So we need to listen. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us the Holy Spirit as you did in the gift of the church at Pentecost to open our minds and hearts to this message today, this message of understanding of your church and the gift that you give us through her. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so as you saw in that first slide, today our topic, I'm also going to take you to Latin class. Let's look at our first slide. Extra ecclesium nulla salus. Okay, extra, our word comes from the Latin, mean outside of. Ecclesium means the church. Nulla means no, so we get null and void. So null, no, and salus, salvation. So outside the church, there is no salvation. Now, is this true? <clears throat> the church has always taught this. The church has always taught there is no salvation outside the church. Oh boy, Father, what about my friends and my family? They're great people. All right. The church also says in Vatican II that non-Catholics can be saved. Well, then how do we reconcile this? Well, here's the problem. Some go to one extreme, claiming that it makes no difference then if non-Catholics can be saved. Doesn't matter what you are. Doesn't matter what religion you are. And others, on the other extreme, say, unless you are a baptized, card-carrying, registered member of the Catholic Church sitting in the pew, you'll be damned. Unless you're all that, you'll be lost. So we have a problem here. What's the answer? Actually, both are wrong. And I'm not giving you my opinion because you may hold one of those extreme opinions. And I get that. But I'm not giving you my opinion here. I'm going to give you church teaching that is developed through the years. So on one of those far ends of the spectrum, it does maybe depend on where in church history you're getting your information. All right. <clears throat> The church has rejected both of those extremes. Let's look at our next slide. <clears throat> this is a priest named Father Feeney out of the Boston area. And you could see there the bishop silenced him. He was actually excommunicated because he taught you must be a physically registered member of the Catholic Church in order to be saved. The church condemned that. It became a big issue in the 1940s and 1950s. He ended up being excommunicated, although I think he did get reconciled before he died. But that means the church made it clear that non-Catholics can get to heaven. Again, then, Father, it doesn't matter that I'm Catholic. No, we're going to get to that. The statement is still true. There's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Well, Father, you're not making any sense then because those two are mutually exclusive. No, they're not. So stay with us. All right. Now, not all Catholics, even though there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, not all Catholics, however, are guaranteed heaven either. There may be more Catholics lost than none. We don't know yet. 
There is no salvation outside of Jesus, and Jesus' body is the church. So we need the church for salvation. While it is normally necessary to be a Catholic in order to be saved, this is what Catechism 846 tells us, and the Vatican II document Lumen Gentium, number 14, I'll, I'll be referencing these, there are exceptions. And Catechism 847 tells us that we can see salvation of those outside of the physical four walls of the Catholic Church. So when we say there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, we're not necessarily talking the physical four walls. It's united with it in spirit in a deeper way, but yet it is physically involving the church because it's where the sacraments are. So again, we got to unpack this, but stay with us because this is probably the deepest seminary course I'm going to take you in. But I think I'm going to try to do it in a way that, that won't be too difficult to understand. So stay with us. All right, now, the first thing we got to do is look at Scripture. Scripture tells us absolutely that the church is needed. John 14, 6 says, Jesus, I was talking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. We all know this. And it's not only Christ that is essential, but also Christ speaking through his church. How do we know this? Let's look at our next slide. He's talking to the apostles now, the men of the first men of the church, the first leaders of the church, the first bishops of the church, the first pope of the church. And he says, he who hears you, meaning the <clears throat> men of the church, hears me. <clears throat> and he who rejects you, rejects me, Luke 10, 16. All right. This is important. The church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's Ephesians 1.23. All right, let's take a look at our next slide. All right, Christ is the church. All right, the church is Christ in the world. And it is mighty God who willed, quote, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. Ephesians 3.10. Very important. Jesus is saying there that it's through the church that the wisdom of God is known. Now, does this mean I don't care what the church says? No, we got to listen to what the church says. To reject the church is to reject Christ because it was Christ who gave his full authority to the church. And this is why it's important. Let's look at another one. Let's look at our next slide. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's from the Gospels of Mark, I'm sorry, Matt and John. Basically, our Lord is saying here is heaven has to follow the church. If the church says you are freed, heaven says you are freed. What you bind in heaven is bind in, on, uh, excuse me, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So Jesus is saying heaven has to follow the church. You can't just simply say, I don't care what the church says, even if you're not Catholic. Because Christ established the Catholic church. There was only the Catholic church for 1,500 years. Does anybody think Jesus would come to earth, which he did, say, I'm going to start a church, which he did, but then say, I'm going to get it wrong for 1,500 years to Martin Luther gets it right. That's impossible. This is the church of Christ. Now, rejecting the church is rejecting Christ according to the scriptures. We just read that. And the teaching of the church along with it. We can't reject that. All right. One can't just create his own religion and follow Jesus of his own creation, the Jesus he wants him to be. There are 40,000 Christian denominations. Every single one was created by a man except the Catholic one. Nobody else even claims that they weren't started by a man because there were no other Christian religions for 1,500 years. 
And so no other Christian religion can even claim they weren't started by a man except for the Catholic Church. It's the only one. It was started by Christ and the apostles. No other church can claim that. The Orthodox with us, of course. All right. So we can't do that. There's consequences if we try to start our own religion. People always say the Catholic, I'm not following the man-made traditions. Well, our religion is not made man-made. It's apostolic. It comes from Christ. Every other religion is man-made. So if somebody says you have a man-made tradition, say, okay, I'd rather just a simple man-made tradition than a man-made religion. Because every other Christian faith other than the Catholic faith is a man-made religion. Every other one. And so we have something important here. That doesn't mean there's not truth in those others. We're going to talk about that. It doesn't mean those others can't be saved. It doesn't mean the others in those faiths are good people. That's not what we're saying. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain that. All right, let's look at some of the history now. Some of the teaching that has not changed, but has developed over time. All right, let's look at the Fourth Lateran Council. Let's look at our next slide. This is the Fourth Council of Lateran in the year 1215. They said, we believe, quote, in our hearts and we profess orally that there is one church and the apostolic church outside of which we believe that no one will be saved. Now, again, that is what we are saying here. But now over the years that has developed deeper. If you just read that, that's the problem when you take one verse of scripture, our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, God bless them, but when you take one isolated quote of scripture and you don't explain the full context, it really messes people up. This is an example of that. So I want to go deeper. In the encyclical, Quanto Confissiamor Moerare in, from Pius IX in 1863, he then started to develop this deeper. Because left by its own, that quote I read from the Fourth Lateran Council makes it sound like Father Feeney was right. No matter what you do, if you're not a registered Catholic, you can't be saved. And that's not what we're saying. What this encyclical in 1863 developed further is it is a very serious error to hold that men who live apart from the true faith and Catholic unity can attain eternal life if they die in this condition. However... The person who is invincibly ignorant of the true religion, meaning they don't know, or who obeys the natural law, like somebody who wasn't shown the faith, like a pygmy in the rainforest, you saying he's going to be damned? No, now the church is saying we're developing this, that those who follow the natural law lives an honest and upright life and is prepared to obey God can be saved through divine grace. Well, wait a minute, Father, that's outside the Catholic Church. No, not really. Again, stay with us. Now we're going to get into the heavy stuff. Vatican II and Lumen Gentium is a very important document that I'm drawing from. Again, not my own teaching. Let's go to our next slide. This is from Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church from Vatican II. The Church of Christ so meaning the church Jesus established, subsists, meaning it exists in the Catholic church governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and truths can be found outside her structure, meaning in other religions there can be truth, such elements as gifts properly belonging to the Church of Christ impel towards Catholic unity. That's Lumen Gentium 8. What is that saying? What that means is the other religions that have truths actually lead you, start leading back to the Catholic faith because it is the truth. All right? So who can be saved? Now we're going to look, we're going to continue looking at Lumen Gentium. There's three main paragraphs. Ralph Martin has written about this. There's three main paragraphs, Lumen Gentium 14, 15, and 16. And right now I'm going to tell you who they, exa uh, who they refer to. In 14, which we're going to talk about first, it is talking about Catholics. How can Catholics be saved? In Lumen Gentium 15, it's talking about non-Catholic Christians, our Protestant brothers and sisters. Can they be saved? And then in 16, it says, how about non-Christians, like Muslims and Jews? Can they be saved? 
And the answer actually on the last two is yes. Protestants can be saved through their linking with the gospel. They're actually united with the Catholic Church, albeit imperfectly, through the gospel. Now, what about non-Christians, Muslims? This goes to what I just read about unless they are, has invincible ignorance. Unless they do not understand or have never been shown God. They've never been taught the gospel or taken to mass. They have what's called invincible ignorance. They don't know. Again, I'm not making this up. This is St. Augustine. Now, let's look at our next two slides. Okay, this is important. All right. This sacred council, meaning Vatican II. Let's talk about, this is uh, paragraph 14. Okay, this now. Before I start this, please listen closely to this paragraph because it finishes with something that's shocking. All right. So please read this one closely. This is paragraph 14, Lumen Gentium. This sacred council wishes to turn its attention first to the Catholics, the Catholic faithful. Basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition, it teaches that the church is necessary for salvation. Christ present to us in his body, which is the church, is the one mediator and the unique way of salvation. All right, let's keep going. He himself, Jesus, affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism and thereby affirmed also the necessity of the church. For through baptism, as through a door, men enter the church. Now, Please listen to this one. This is, oh man, this is a biggie. Whoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to refuse to remain in it cannot be saved. Oh boy. What do we do now? All right. Uh, I'm going to get to this one. The point is, I really believe, like my nephew who has left the church, I believe that they really don't know the Catholic Church is the true church of Christ. If they did, they wouldn't leave. So I still have hope for my nephew's salvation, who is a baptized Catholic who left the church. I still believe he can be saved because I don't believe he knows it's the true faith. The problem is, who holds, somebody's got to be responsible for that. Sadly, probably mostly his godfather, especially when his godfather, as I've always said, is a priest, me. And so we have been charged to bring our loved ones to the church. And so this is a very scary statement, but one that should wake us up. It doesn't necessarily mean that we should get despairing or we should run in fear, but it means we should wake up. We have to bring our loved ones to the church. So we hope that when they leave, it's because it's, it's, it's they just don't understand it. But then our, our obligation is to make sure they understand it or else we're responsible for themselves, those people being lost. My gosh, it scares me to death wondering if I might be responsible for my nephew. That's why I try to talk to him about this. All right, but don't, don't think that, don't give up on this or don't think this is too easy for Catholics because you automatically have the Church of Christ. Even those in the church have responsibilities, as I just said. This is what it says, continuing Lumen Gentium. I don't have a slide, but I'll read it. He is not saved, however, who though part of the body of the church, meaning Catholics, does not persevere in charity. That means Catholics, if they were not living charity, we can be in trouble. If they fail, moreover, to respond to that grace, so if we fail to respond to the grace, in thought, word, or deed, not only shall they not be saved, but they will be more severely judged. That means we as Catholics, to whom much is given, much is expected. We've been given the fullness of the true faith, so we're expected to live it deeply. We must be charitable. So even Catholics, am I sitting up here saying all Catholics will go to heaven? No. Catholics can be lost too if we're not living a life of charity. And so this is important. Now, that was paragraph 14. Paragraph 15 talks about non-Catholic Christians like Baptists, uh, Methodists. These have scripture and baptism 
a belief in the Trinity, so they are united with Christ. Albeit imperfectly, but they're united to his body, the church. So by the word church, again, we don't necessarily mean the four walls. Church is in the heart, right? But we do mean it in the sense that it gives us the sacraments. So in other words, if you're outside of the four walls, yeah, there's still a potential you can be saved. But if you're inside the four walls, you've got a greater chance, a much greater chance, because you have the guaranteed grace of the sacraments. So I'm not saying the four walls aren't important. They are important, but I'm not saying the four walls are absolutely imperative that anybody outside of the four walls will go to hell. I'm not saying that, or I should say the church isn't saying that. All right, now, <clears throat> let's go on to our next slide. Paragraph 16 of Lumen Gentium. This is non-Christians, Muslims and Jews, for example. This mentions Muslims and Jews because the plan for self of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. Well, Father, wait a minute. The, the Jews, Muslims? Yes, I will talk about that. Those also can attain to salvation, who through no fault of their own, that's invincible ignorance, do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, meaning non-Christians, yet sincerely seek God and moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. What does that mean? God puts the natural law in every heart. That means if you're not Christian, but you are still following the natural law God put on your heart, yes, there is a chance for salvation. All right, this is the natural law. This is why it's important that we go out to these non-Christians, that we evangelize to bring them to the gospel. Like I said, a pygmy in the rainforest, you know, uh, he, he has a chance to be saved, but Father, he never went to church or read the gospel. Yeah, he'll be judged differently than you. You and I, baptized Catholics, will be held to a much higher standard. Who much is given, much more is expected. We are judged on how we use the grace God gave us. And as a Catholic, God gave you a ton of grace. He didn't give to anybody else. Mainly the sacraments, the church, the mass. To who much is given, much is expected. All right. Now, I said, sorry, we're going to get into the deep, deep, seminary, but I think, I think we, you can stay with me here. All right, let's go to our next one. This is another Vatican II document, Unitatis Redentegratio, and let's read what it has to say. For this is, uh, for the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them, the separated churches, as instruments of salvation, which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. Oh, interesting. Nevertheless, our separated brethren are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on all those to whom he has given new birth into one body. That one body is his church, and there was only one church for 1,500 years. Now, let's continue. For it is through Christ Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help towards salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. Okay, what that means is these other religions do have some truth, but the Catholic Church and only the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth. This is what we have to say. Notice that it says fullness. Others have partial. All right, so let's summarize this. Catholics have direct access to salvation through the sacraments. This is powerful. Others have indirect access, but it still could work. Okay, let me give you an example. All of us could go from Boston to LA, all right? So we're here in Massachusetts. Anybody who wants to go to Boston to LA, there's three basic ways to do it, all right? And it's possible. All right, the first way is you could walk. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but it's possible. That's like non-Christians. There's going to take a lot longer. It's much harder. There's much more dangers. You could get run over. You could get um, uh, injured. You could, it's just really difficult to walk from Boston to L.A. I'm sorry, to New York. I said New York, but let's say Boston to L.A. So you want to go Boston to LA, you could technically walk. You could technically do it. That's your objective. You reach your end goal, heaven. 
Well, I don't know if LA is heaven or not, but <laughs> probably anything but, but you get my point. That's like non-Christians. They can do it by sheer effort if they have the grace of God and cooperate with it. So God will get them there safely. Now, the second way to get there is you could drive. This is like the Protestants or non-Catholic Christians. You technically can do it. It's not, it's not impossible. You can get in the car, but again, you could run out of gas. You could uh, have accidents. You could get lost. It's still possible, but it's not the easiest, quickest, surest way. That's like our non-Catholic Christian brethren, the, the, uh, the Baptists or the Lutherans or the Methodists. Now, or you can get in a supersonic F-18 supersonic jet and boom, straight there. The quickest, easiest, surest, fastest way to get there. Supersonic jet. That's like the Catholic faith. It gives you the sacraments, the guaranteed grace to get you to heaven. This is what we're talking about. So your religion does matter. If it didn't, why did Jesus give the great commission? Go and baptize them. Bring them into the faith and go and make disciples of all nations. Who is he talking about? Make disciples of what? His church. All right. So if it didn't matter, it wouldn't be important. Other religions can help in some ways, but they can also hinder your salvation. Christ in fact, Buddha's not going to get you to heaven. Allah's not going to get you to heaven. Only Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. Christ redeemed everyone, but only those who cooperate with his grace will be saved. And the best way to do that is through his church. That's where he pours the graces through, especially in the sacraments. All right. How do we know this? Well, let's look at our next slide. We know this because when speaking of salvation, Jesus talked about three verses. Let's look at these. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's Mark. That's baptism. Unless you are born, I think it was John, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. We need baptism. That's a sacrament. Next, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is asking for forgiveness. That's Luke. That's confession. Next, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. This is John 6, the bread from heaven. This is the Eucharist. So Jesus associated salvation with baptism, confession, and the Eucharist. This is the church. You don't get those anywhere else. You don't get those in your own bedroom. You don't get those at a prayer a jamboree at some big mega church. You get those here in the Catholic church. Catholics recognize that these sacraments are administered through the church. To reject salvation on the terms Christ gave, he just gave that in the Bible, is to reject salvation itself. Christ gave the church for salvation. The sacraments are not just symbols. They do something. You've heard me say this. They are what makes us different. Since the sacraments are the ordinary means through which Christ offers grace necessary for salvation, and the Catholic Church that Christ established is the minister of those sacraments, it is appropriate to state that salvation comes through the church. Does it therefore follow that anyone who is not visibly within the church is necessarily damned? No. Still less does it follow that everyone who is inside the four walls of the church is necessarily saved. That's not true either. There may be members of the church whose membership is known to God alone. That pygmy in the rainforest might be more aligned with the church than a priest sometimes. If anyone is saved, it must be in some sense through the church. In what sense, we can't say. We don't always know. Let's look at our next slide, <clears throat> St. Cyprian. No one can have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. That's why we call Mary the mother of the church. If no one could escape the deluge outside of the ark of Noah... No one outside the church will escape life's deluge. That's St. Cyprian. 
This is important. This is why we have to listen to the church. Christ himself told his disciples that he who does not believe shall be condemned. That's Mark 16. So we have to understand what is going on here. Let's take a look at the catechism. The catechism lays out the truth of this very succinctly in paragraphs 830 and then again in paragraphs 846, 47, and 48. I'm just going to kind of summarize them for you. There is no salvation apart from Christ. We all know that. And his one holy Catholic and apostolic church is his body. Therefore, if there's no salvation outside of Jesus and Jesus' body is the church, there is an oasis, a salvation way through his church because it's his body. Again, this is infallible teaching. It's not up for debate among Catholics. We have to believe this. But those who are invincibly ignorant, as we said, concerning the truth of that church may not be culpable, may not be responsible for lacking the knowledge. They may not have been taught it. Next, those who have been that invincibly ignorant have the responsibility, possibility, I'm sorry, possibility of salvation, even if they never come to an explicit knowledge of Christ and his church. That's what Vatican II teaches, not me. As we will talk about invincibly ignorant does not mean just because a person never learned about Jesus, they'll automatically go to heaven. No, it doesn't mean that. That's why don't tell yourself, oh, I'll just stay ignorant. No, it doesn't mean they will automatically be saved. Ignorance is not bliss. It's dangerous. All right. What it means is that they have the possibility of salvation, but it's much more difficult than if they were in the Catholic Church. If they are ignorant of the truth through no fault of their own, then the limited amount of truth that they do have serves as a preparation when God reveals himself to them at some point, even maybe at the moment of their death. That's Catechism 843. So anyone who is saved is not saved by his false religious beliefs. Judaism that rejects Christ Islam that rejects Jesus as the son of God. These are not going to save you. They're not necessarily going to condemn you if you're open to the truth either. Rather, they can be saved, but not because of those religions. They may be saved in spite of them. This is what the church teaches. All religions have some of the truth, but only the Catholic Church has, as I said, the fullness of the truth. In order to get to heaven, a person must have died in sanctifying grace, in a state of, of grace. The guaranteed grace is where? How do you get that guaranteed grace? The church, the sacraments, of which Chris, Christ is the invisible head. So, wow, so much here. Let's break this down. There still seems to be an apparent disconnect, though. You might still be confused. That extra ecclesiam nulla salus, no salvation outside of the church, and the idea that some people who are not formally Catholics can still be saved still seems maybe confusing to some of you. The church teaches that the possibility of salvation for those who do not have a formal relationship, meaning they're not a formal registered parishioner with the church, yet they do have a possible salvific relationship with the church. What does that mean, Father? All right. The necessity of salvation is in Jesus Christ. We know this. And he said, quote, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. This is John 15, 22 and John 9, 41. Basically, as Catholics, we know the truth. So we now have the responsibility to whom much is given, much is expected. Jesus says a person is not responsible if they didn't know. Well, then again, Father, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. No, not in today's day and age. You can't run and hide from information anymore. With the internet, television, a church on every street corner, or used to be at least, 
you really don't have an excuse for not knowing the truth. Nobody could really in the Western world, I believe, could go before God and say, God, I had no idea that Jesus was the Savior and abortion is wrong and Christ started a church. That's why I didn't follow it, Jesus. No, you really can't use that excuse today. Information is everywhere. So what about those who don't, like in Saudi Arabia or the Amazon rainforest, or maybe even here in the United States, there's some examples. It is possible to have a salvific link with Christ. Maybe not necessarily formal, where you're a registered parishioner, but salvific link, which can bring salvation without normally, formally being a Catholic. They don't have a formal relationship with the church, meaning they haven't been formally baptized into the church and have made a profession of faith with, with the church, but they're being led by Christ. Now, this is not the preferred way. This is not the easiest way. This is like walking Boston to L.A., but it's possible. So don't write me and tell me, Father, you're telling me the church isn't important. I'm saying the church is critically important. This means that one can have a salvific relationship with the church without knowing the truth that the church is the fullness of Christ on earth and having a formal relationship inside of it. See the case of Cornelius. Remember him in the Bible? Who was Cornelius? I actually lived, worked in, uh, in North Carolina next to a town called Cornelius. He was the centurion in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. He was praying to God before he knew Jesus. He didn't know Jesus yet, but yet he was following the will of God. There are different ways a person can have a salvific link with Christ and the Catholic Church, his body. This can be done via even the sacraments, for instance. The Orthodox Church has seven valid sacraments, so they're united with our church. What about the Protestants? Yeah, they actually have the sacraments of baptism and marriage. So they can be in a related salvific link with the church. So if you say there's no salvation outside the church, it could include them because they have a link to that church. They're not formally registered, but they have a link to that church, our church. Or it may be through the Bible. That's a link to our church. Or by sharing some of the truth that the religion holds, that Jesus is a savior, he died for our sins. That's a link. So if folks outside of the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church are truly seeking the truth and have not rejected the fullness of the truth found in the Catholic Church, they have the possibility of being saved. So, if this is true, let's go to our next slide. Why the heck be Catholic? Father, you're telling me that I got all these other options. No. Why would you walk Boston to L.A. when you can fly a jet fighter? Amazing. The possibility of salvation for those who are not formally Catholic is much more difficult. And it's led to this belief that all religions are equal. Not true. This is condemned by the church. Nobody who deliberately rejects the truth given by Christ to this Catholic Church can be saved. Pius XII makes this clear that they can be saved, but they still remain deprived of those many heavenly gifts and helps which can only be enjoyed in the Catholic Church and are, unfortunately, in a state in which they cannot be sure of their salvation. In the Catholic Church with the sacraments, if you're in a state of grace, you're assured of your salvation. All the other ways, it's possible, but not guaranteed. This is what Christ said through the church. He said it's through the church. You must be baptized, be forgiven of your sins, receive the bread of life. That only comes through the Catholic Church. There is no true Eucharist at the other faith. Well, we have communion, Father. It's not sacramental transubstantiation, true body blood of Jesus Christ. It's a symbol. Here, it's the actual grace. So you can only find that in the Catholic Church. We must remember that we are not the judges, however, of salvation. I'm not sitting up here trying to say that I can tell you who's saved and not only God can. We know this. We do not know who is invincibly ignorant, for example. 
I don't know if the terrorists uh, in, of Islam are invincibly ignorant or they do know better. And, and, and who isn't? Who is and who isn't? Therefore, we must continue to evangelize all people. Reconciliation with the church is inseparable from reconciliation with God. That is Catechism 1445, because Christ delegated his authority to the church. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. Christ is connecting to the church. He delegated his authority to the church. Now, what about Catholics who have left the faith? Oh man, here we go. This is going to affect every one of us, myself included. Are they okay? Or are they lost? It would be the height of presumption for us to say that someone who has left the faith is okay. They're a good person. There's more to it. Now, it may be well that a person who left the faith may have left because of a distorted notion, thinking that Catholics worship Mary and I don't want to be part of that. Well, that's actually a good thing. Sadly, they're, misunder they're misunder or mistaken. All right, but some people who may have left had a distorted notion of what the church really truly is. Remember, I say this all the time on my comments on YouTube. People slam the Catholic faith, worshiping statues and, 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 and Mary and all this. And I always state that, you know, millions of people, Fulton Sheen said, hate what they think is the Catholic church, but very few, if any, hate what is actually the Catholic church. All right. So what she teaches, if you leave for those types of reasons, you may not be fully culpable. You may not, if you don't truly understand and you left because you misunderstood something, yeah, there's some responsibility to learn the truth, but you might not be fully responsible because you left for a good reason. I don't want to worship Mary. The sad part is we don't worship Mary. However, it may be well that they are culpable. They could be responsible because they don't care. They just use it as an excuse. I know a lot of people who just, I don't want anything to do with it. They just use it as an excuse. The scandal. I'm not going to be part of the church. Well, you've heard me say you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Judas is not the Savior. He's the opposite. He betrayed the Savior. We've had some priests do that. That doesn't take away the truth of the church. It means we've had some stupid people and things that have done some dumb things unexcusable they need to be addressed but you don't leave the church because of it no amount of church attendance is somewhere else or 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 apart from the church that jesus established the catholic church will get you to heaven so we must take serious anybody who has left the faith or anyone who is not in union with the church because objectively speaking it's very serious barring invincible ignorance, of course. Souls are on the line. Christ listed the way to heaven, baptism, repentance, or confession, and the Eucharist, the bread of life, in order to enter the kingdom of God. You know that video you saw that Brother Mark showed, or no, I'm sorry, I haven't shown it yet. I'll show you coming up. Is of a guy named, a theologian named Jimmy Aiken. If you ever have a chance to watch Jimmy Aiken, he's one of the best out there. He's one that I follow. And we'll show a video of him in a minute. But I want to quote you some things that he said that I thought were good. You know, he talks about that we have baptism. Christ said that you need to be baptized to get to heaven. Well, wait a minute, though. He goes on and says, don't forget, baptism is not just by water, but could be of blood or baptism of desire. Even if it's only implicit, the desire. Not meaning explicit, meaning I want to be a baptized Catholic and I get martyred beforehand. No, even if it's implicit, you're not sure about what the truth of the Catholic faith is, but you have this desire to be with God. There could be a baptism of desire. Now, the baptism of blood and the baptism of desires are valid baptisms. You don't want to go that route. Make it guaranteed through the sacrament of water. But this baptism of blood and desire brings about the fruits of baptism without having to be an official sacrament. Father, how dare you say that? It's Catechism 1258. Catechism 1258 says that. Implicit desire 
Let's talk about the desire part now. It's the principle that makes it possible for non-Catholics to be saved. That you have a desire to be baptized in one sense. That means union with God, free of sin. If they are committed to seeking the truth, those who are not in the church, then they are implicitly committed to seeking Jesus and living by his commands. If they really are desiring the truth, that means they are desiring Christ because Christ is the truth. Even if they don't know that Christ is the truth they are seeking, that's implicit. Now, some say unbaptized persons are outside the church, period. No unbaptized people can be saved. If this is true, then the blood and the desire are meaningless, and that's not what the church teaches. It is true that baptism is required for full incorporation into the church. That's Catechism 837. But it is not true that all of the unbaptized are unlinked and completely unattached to the church in every way. It doesn't mean that. In 256, Cyprian of Carthage stated that catechumens, those coming into the church, who are martyred before baptism had, quote, another baptism to be baptized with. That's also Luke chapter 12, verse 50, if you don't like what I'm saying here. Thomas Aquinas said, the sacrament of baptism may be wanting to someone both in reality and in desire. What is necessary for salvation is that salvific link to the church, to the body of Christ, not necessarily full cooperation and formal registration in the church, but a link. So this is what Jimmy Aiken said. Now let's watch this video of Jimmy Aiken. Again, if you've seen him, you can trust what he tells you. This is a great theologian. So let's listen to two and a half minutes of Jimmy Aiken. For a person to know that Jesus is God's Christ, the Savior of mankind, and to refuse to repent, believe, and be baptized into his church would be to reject salvation on the terms that God offers it, and thus to reject salvation itself. That's why the church fathers said that there's no salvation outside the church. But the early Christians also recognized that many people aren't in that situation. They may not have joined the church, but it may not have been through any fault of their own. They didn't knowingly and deliberately reject God's offer of salvation. What about people in this situation? A lot of people had no chance to respond to the Christian message because they never heard it. Thus, when St. Paul talked to the people of Athens, he told them God overlooked the times of idolatry in hopes that men would feel after him and find him and that some of their own thinkers had arrived at a partial knowledge of God. In his letter to the Romans, Paul speaks of how some Gentiles who have never heard the word of God nevertheless obey God's law because it's written on their hearts. He then seems to hold out the possibility of salvation for them, saying that their consciences may excuse them on the day of judgment. This theme was also picked up by the church fathers. St. Justin Martyr held that those who had not heard the gospel could be saved if they lived according to reason. And the Greek word he uses for reason is logos, the same word that St. John uses to refer to the pre-incarnate Christ in the prologue of his gospel. The idea was that without explicitly hearing Christ preached, some Gentiles lived according to reason, according to the logos, and thus had a kind of implicit connection with Christ that would enable them to be saved. It was still through Christ that they would be saved, though they didn't know that in this life. And so today, the church holds to both of these themes. It recognizes the necessity of Christ and his church for salvation, but it also recognizes that some people who are not fully incorporated into his church can still be related to it in a way that makes salvation possible for them. The fact that it's possible for people to be saved without being fully incorporated into the church, though, doesn't mean that they don't need to hear the message of Christ or that we don't need to evangelize them. After all, Jesus himself said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, so again, that was Jimmy Aiken, a great Catholic theologian that you can find that has uh, really good insight. Now, let's go back for a minute to Lumen Gentium, that Vatican II document. And it says, many elements of sanctification and truth, for example, scripture and the action of the Holy Spirit, are found outside of the visible structure of the Catholic Church, but these elements as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling back to the Catholic faith. So it's in other words, you can find scripture in the Holy Spirit outside of the Catholic Church because they go everywhere, but since they came from the Catholic Church, they draw back to the Catholic Church. Isn't that fascinating? That's to me amazing. And so we have to think about this. Thus, the church can serve as the sacrament of salvation even for those outside of her visible borders. The church says that anybody, if he is saved, will find in some way he is united to the Catholic church. This is even scriptural. Oh, come on, Father, what are you talking about? All right. John the apostle said, and this is Mark chapter 9, verse 38 through 40. Teacher, we saw a man casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he was not following us. Now these are the men of the church. And John's saying they're not following us, the men of the church. Jesus said, do not forbid him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is for us. What is that, Father? John wrongly is saying if you are not a formal, visible member of the inner circle with the church, you are not following them. You are not part of the apostolic college of bishops or the church, then you can't possibly be under the influence of Jesus. And Jesus corrects him. He says, no, that is not, those who are not against us are for us. But would you rather be on the inner circle with the apostles or rather somewhere else trying to figure out your way around the countryside? Which one would you prefer? All right, it makes the common sense point that there is no salvation outside the church because Jesus is in the center of that inner circle. That is the church. His inner circle was forming the first men of the church. Yet some folks are linked with the church from the outside in ways that they don't realize or in ways that we can even see. Only God does. The church has always insisted on the necessity of being in union with the church that's why it means when it says there's no salvation outside of the church. But it has simultaneously refused to make any judgment that who is not linked to it from the outside. In other words, the church has never declared somebody is in hell. Even Hitler, Mao, Taistong, Stalin, the church has never declared anti-saints. The antichrist will come. But they've never said there's a particular living person dead or, I'm sorry, that has died, that is in hell. Catechism 257 states, God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but he is not bound by his own sacraments. Oh, that's interesting. Well, Father, what about limbo then? What about my child who died before baptism? Limbo is not official church teaching. We believe that infants who die without baptism may be saved and brought to eternal happiness because they are under the age of reason. There was no way they could have made a decision for Christ. They were infants. Do you think those little children murdered the holy innocents so that Christ could flee are not going to have eternal reward? Of course they will. God can therefore give the grace of baptism without the actual sacrament being conferred. It is through Jesus himself that he can do it. He is the sacrament. But all salvation comes from him and therefore in some way through the church. And when you have the sacraments of the church, it's him delegating it. So much rather go that way. All right. So I want to point out one other point that looks like to some people a Catholic contradiction. All right, this was the, I made the statement a few years ago, there's only one passage in the entire catechism I vehemently disagree with. 
I was a seminarian. And I made the point that there's one paragraph in the catechism that is wrong, and I disagree with it. And it says that the Muslims worship the same God as us, and I said, that's impossible. Our God is Trinitarian, theirs is not. Their God would never condescend to become one of us. There is no incarnation in their God. They reject Jesus. This is impossible. The catechism is wrong. This catechism passage appears to contradict the doctrine of there's no salvation outside the church. Let's read it. Next slide. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold, profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Catechism 841. I was vehemently against it until I really read and understood, believe it or not, preparing for this presentation. So I am benefiting so much from taking you guys to seminary. <laughs> And I hope you guys are too. We must understand the context. Those Muslims, or basically anyone of another religion, all right, or even non-religious, who are not responsible for their ignorance of the Catholic faith, as we said before, can be saved. Now, Catechism 841 is not saying that anyone who is a good person will go to heaven. It's not saying that. You need grace and to cooperate with that grace. Somebody who's not following the natural law is not cooperating with that grace. A Jewish person will not be saved by being a good Jew. A Muslim will not be saved by being a good Muslim, nor a Protestant by being a good Protestant. As I said before, they can be saved, but not because of those religions. You're not going to be saved because of Buddha. You are only saved because of Jesus Christ. If those people get to heaven, it won't be because of the religions, but despite them in a sense. Because a Jew or a Muslim doesn't understand the role of Christ yet, but there's something to learn here. So let me answer that question. Let's take it to our next slide. Do the Muslims worship the same God? Tim Staples weighs in on this. He says, you got to look, there are two distinct declarations in that catechism statement. It says, first, Muslims profess to hold the faith of Abraham, meaning they claim it. We're not claiming it. They do. And together with us, they adore the one merciful God, our mankind's last judge. Now, let's look at this. The declarations that Muslims adore the one God is not explained in the catechism. So Tim Staples clarified this. He said, we can see that Islam links itself to Abraham. They profess, they profess that they hold the faith of Abraham. This is not saying there is a link. Rather, it is saying that the Muslims claim there's a link. JP2 acknowledges the truth that Muslims get it right when they profess faith in one God, but he says that they have it wrong when it comes to what that God, who he really is. They misunderstand who he is and what he asks of his people. So is there invincible ignorance? Meaning that's not their fault, perhaps. Perhaps not, if you're not following the natural law either. Now let's go back to Jimmy Aiken, who you just saw in the video. The church's understanding, he says, is that Muslims don't fully understand God. But that doesn't make them necessarily rotten or evil because of that fact. They're good or bad based on, just like us, their choices of free will. It doesn't mean that they aren't genuinely directing their prayers towards a true creator. They just have some incomplete or erroneous understanding of him. They have error, but it doesn't mean that they don't have a genuine relationship with God. Like the Jews, they don't understand that God is a trinity. They don't believe that Jesus is God. But you know what? That has never stopped the church from recognizing that Jewish people worship God. You know, the Jews don't accept Jesus. They don't accept the Trinity, but no Catholic has ever said the Jews don't worship God. 
So it could be the same for the Muslims. Now, you got to be careful, though, because as I said, their understanding of Allah is a God that is not our God. It wouldn't condescend to become one of us. So it's not Trinitarian. But neither do the Jews. They don't believe that either. So man, did this hit me when I was doing this. I was like, the Jews are, 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 are right in line and the Muslims are not, but yet they fit the exact same category. Man, did that change my opinion. Some theologians have extended the idea to say that every dying person is faced with a supreme moral test at the moment of death in which its destiny depends. And at that moment, these non-Christians will be revealed something special. They will receive a special revelation of Jesus and they will then have the chance to accept him or not. That's where the salvation comes in from. But you know what? If you spend your whole life rejecting something, it's going to be hard to say yes to it even at the moment of death. So start accepting Christ now so that when he comes to you at the end of your life, it'll be easier to say yes. This is amazing. All right, so let's finish up here. <clears throat> Wrapping up. We actually might be finished early today. Mortal sin has three elements. <clears throat> the only way you're going to be lost, the only way a soul is lost, is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. Do you hear that? To die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. What makes a sin mortal? Is saying, doggone it, my team lost the game. Is that a mortal sin? No. Paul says some sins are deadly, some are not. What makes a sin deadly or mortal is that it has grave matter, like abortion or, or you, know, um, you, know, you know the serious ones. You have to have full knowledge. In other words, not invincible ignorance. You have knowledge and free will to choose the sin. If all three are present and you don't repent, you're lost. So leaving the Catholic Church is that first one, grave matter. Leaving the Catholic Church is objectively grave, but subjectively we don't know if they had full knowledge or free will. Maybe they left because they were abused. I wouldn't call that free will. I would say the priest is much more in jeopardy. I'm going to be talking on a future Saturday about the scandal, but that person may not have free will. They left. So subjectively, they may not be culpable. It may not be mortal because they didn't fully know or have free will. If they had full knowledge and freedom, then it's trouble, it's problem. But only God knows that. That's why we can never say a sin is mortal. You can't say that a politician is living in mortal sin because you don't know what he knows or doesn't know and what kind of free will he has or not. If one rejects the church, that is grave, yes, but has no knowledge of what they are doing, then it's not damnable. Yeah, that's kind of hard to say today because we have all the knowledge at our fingertips. You have all the information at your fingertips. So I don't want to make this as a crutch. If they refuse to be baptized or enter into communion with the Catholic Church, you have to look at why. <clears throat> just because somebody isn't doesn't mean it's 100% damnation or 100% heaven. We don't know. You have to look at the situation. If they refuse to enter or leave it because they are reacting to other people within the church or they're really rejecting the evangelizers, the priests or whoever, rather than the good news of the scriptures and Jesus himself, that's not the same thing as rejecting Jesus. It's still bad. You still put yourself in a very bad position. You've just given up the jet that was flying from Boston to LA. Now you got to walk. But it's possible. Also, the gift of faith. Faith is a gift. Not everyone is given faith to the same degree, with the same clarity. If he doesn't give supernatural faith, God, if he doesn't give it to someone, then he can't hold them accountable. Then he will never 
They will never have it, and he can never judge them for not having it. Faith is a gift. All right? It doesn't come by our own efforts. But then, don't forget Jesus. Well, somebody will say, well, Father, then that means my son who's living in mortal sin. I'm fine then with that because just God didn't give him the gift. No, God will give everybody the grace for salvation. In one way or another. The natural law, the sacraments, faith. Remember how to get to heaven? We already talked about three of them. Baptism, confession, and the Eucharist, but also faith and doing the will of God. That's in the scripture that you have to have to get to heaven. Who we have been, or we who have been given the gift of the Catholic faith, have the obligation to bring others to it. So last page. I'm going to wrap up here early, hopefully, as I said. Let's go back to extra ecclesium nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Let's go back to that. St. Justin Martyr offered this assessment of how one can belong to the church of Christ. He said, Christ is the logos, the divine word. Those who lived according to logos, meaning wisdom and truth, are Christians, even if they're not part of the church. He used the Greeks, like Socrates. Socrates wasn't a Catholic, but he followed wisdom and truth. So, St. Justin Martyr was basically saying he was a Christian without saying so. I, I say that about C.S. Lewis. The great writer, my favorite writer, I say C.S. Lewis was a Catholic and didn't know it. Now, it would been a lot easier for him if he would have come to the Catholic Church. Yes. According to St. Paul, if a person obeys the law of God written on his heart, he is obeying Christ the Logos and is essentially accepting the Spirit of Christ even if he's not fully aware of it. St. Paul tells us, he says, you Greeks didn't even know it, but you were worshiping God. This shows, again, that the pygmy in the rainforest can be saved by the natural law. But again, it's harder. Don't say, well, oh, Father, you're, you're telling me I can reject the church now and still make it to heaven. Yeah, if you want to make it a lot more difficult on yourself, and you still have to have a lot more going for you, you got to have charity going for you. If you think it's just not being part of the church that I can still get to heaven, there's a lot of other factors. You got to be charitable. You got to live by love. You got to follow the commandments of God. The way you want to do that is through the help of the sacraments because they give you the guaranteed grace to persevere. Man, without the sacraments, I wouldn't make it a day. So you don't want to reject them. So let's go back here. Now, let's talk about this. God really does desire that all men be saved, and he gives the grace for all men to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Now, I want to give one last encyclical. All right. This one is powerful. This was the 1943 encyclical, Mystici Corporis. Now, it says that while, let's look up on the screen. While membership in the church is indeed an absolute requirement for salvation, such membership does not necessarily have to be visible to the human eye and can be characterized by even desire and longing, whether explicit, in the case of catechumens coming into the church, or implicit, as I've been saying, in the case of the invincibly ignorant. Let's keep going. At the same time, souls in the latter case, quote, cannot be sure of their salvation. This is exactly what I've been telling you. Since they still remain deprived of many heavenly gifts and helps which can only be enjoyed in the Catholic Church. Wow. That is the best summary of this whole talk. That one encyclical from 1943. John Paul II in 1990 wrote an encyclical, Redemptoris Missio, that said some can be saved who are not formally a part of the church, but they can attain salvation through his or her cooperation with the grace. And where do we get that grace? From the church. It's from Jesus ultimately, but through his church. That's why at the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had the apostles distribute the bread, the communion. He uses the church. 
The catechism addresses the notion of the correct interpretation of the patristic formula extra ecclesium nulla salus by again quoting the Second Vatican Council. Here is the catechism 846 and 47. I don't have a slide, but I'll read it to you. Basing itself on sacred scripture and sacred tradition, the council upholds that the church is necessary for salvation. Hence, they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse to either enter it or remain in it. I read this to you earlier. It was paragraph 14 of Lumen Gentium. Now it's in the Catechism, both places. This affirmation, however is not aimed at those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and his church. I mentioned the example of my nephew, Brian. Again, I believe that he just doesn't know that the Catholic Church is the fullness. As I said, I might be more responsible, so we have to pray for those loved ones who have left. Don't come out of this church or at this talk thinking, well, Father says it's okay now, they might get to heaven, I'm going to count on that. No, you still got to do your part. You're the one that might be responsible. You have to pray for them. Now, don't get despairing. Don't say, Father, you ruined my day. You're blaming me for my child. No, I'm not. No, no, no. I said, maybe. I, I, I'm wondering if I might be responsible for my nephew. I don't know. Only God knows, but I don't want to be the cause of it. So I try what I can. First and foremost, prayer. Have masses said for them. Offer your suffering for them. Pray the rosary for them. Pray the chaplet for them. Well, Father, I can't even talk about religion to them. Pray for them. They don't even have to know you had a mass said for them. Important stuff. Many times, Protestants reject things that we would reject too, as I said. Like worshiping Mary, they leave for that reason. So they're not necessarily apart from the church for bad reasons. It's just maybe a misunderstanding. Our job is to clarify their understanding. That's why I enjoy people writing to me. Now, sometimes it's late at midnight and I might get a little frustrated. I've answered for the 25th time, Father, call nobody, or excuse me, call no man your father. <laughs> I had to laugh because Brother Mark, when he turned on the video today, he turned on the posting. The very first comment today said, Call no man your father. <laughs> I've said before, that is the biggest complaint I get, and I've answered it many, many times online, and so it's out there. But anyway, they're not evil saying that. They're doing what they think is the right thing. Our job is to explain it to them. That's what our job is, and I've done that many, many times. All right, so let's go to the next final couple slides of the presentation that's my favorite picture of Jesus. I love that picture of Jesus. Whether we are Catholic or not, there is only one way to salvation, that is Jesus Christ. But don't forget, his body is the church. So you don't want to neglect the church. The church is needed. This is powerful. You know, the world today says, well, don't be Hitler and you'll be saved. That is not true. Not according to the Bible and St. Faustina. Her paragraph number 153, this is not the case. Many people will be lost. There's five conditions, as I've been saying, for salvation in the Bible. Baptism, repent, confession, the Eucharist, faith, and doing God's will. It mentions nothing about being a good person. Heaven is not a prize for those who are just good. It's for the active disciples of Christ. We are created good, but we got broken. And on our own, we are not good, so we need grace. The way to get to heaven, I've spent this before, non-Catholic Christians say it's only grace, and many Catholics say, well, it's only good works. You need both. God gives the grace, but we got to cooperate with it by loving him and loving our neighbor. But how does he give that grace in the first place? Through his church. The good news is we're not left alone. We have grace in the sacraments. We are saved by grace, but we must cooperate with that by loving God and our neighbor, as I said. You know, the groom, you've always heard me talk about the mass as the wedding. The groom wants you at the wedding. But I'll tell you what, 
If you don't go, the wedding will go on without you. This is why the Bible says the doors to the wedding feast were closed and locked and those could, others could not get in. Don't be one of those others. The church, Stephen Ray, a good friend of mine, says it's like the ark. Don't put yourself outside of the ark. The Protestants, he says, are like on these little rafts. They're like, they're, they're, they're not lost yet. They're on the rafts, not just Protestants, but non-Catholics. Non, non they're like the rafts. They're on these rafts outside the ark. Our job is to get them back on the ark. That's our job. We are saved by grace, but we must cooperate with it. The church is the ordinary way to salvation because it ministers the grace of the sacraments. And Father, why do you say that? Because Jesus said so. I just read you all of those biblical quotes in the Bible about the church. But God isn't constrained by those sacraments. He is above them if he so chooses. But don't gamble that God's going to save me in an extraordinary way. You have an ordinary way of salvation, the church. So don't gamble that God's got to do some extraordinary thing outside his own sacraments. He wants to work in the sacraments. The church is the ordinary way to salvation, but God can go beyond that. But don't push him. Stay within the way he gave us. To determine that you're going to be saved by another way different from what he gave us, that's not the right thing to do. The church, why risk it? Go to church. No non-Catholic religions will get you to heaven in and of themselves. Only this one will, accepting the grace. So yes, it is true. There is no salvation outside the Catholic church. But remember, there are no guarantees within it either. You still got to love Jesus, love God, love your neighbor, and have faith. That is a beautiful message given to us by Christ himself. Amen? Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Now remember, all of this, as I finish, is based on God's divine mercy. All of this is because of God's divine mercy. So let me show you a couple quick last slides. One is the book that I have right now that we are offering that you can get for any donation. Um, you can get my book at, uh, at divine mercy. Dot, I'm sorry, thedivinemercy.org slash UDM for Understanding Divine Mercy. Or you can call us anytime at 800-462-7426 and you can get a copy for any donation, even a dollar, just get a copy. It's, I want it in your hands. It talks about the importance of God's church. I really explain the mass in there and God's grace of the sacraments. And then last... Become one of our family. Become a Marian helper. We're talking about grace all day today. You want to be a member? You want to receive that grace of God's church? You can really take it to a new level. At micprayers.org, simply come. It doesn't take but a second. There's no cost. There's no obligation except pray for us. We pray for you. And you receive those graces as if you were a Marian father of the Immaculate Conception. Just like Brother Mark or me, you get the benefit of getting those same graces we do without having to be a priest or brother. So come to micprayers.org. And, 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 and like I said, there's no cost. It takes 10 seconds and start receiving these incredible graces. All right. And you know what else? Hit our like or subscribe button. If you're watching on Facebook, hit like, please. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe because that helps us as the more subscribers we get, we're already up to almost 160,000. That means our videos are put out there more and people suggested watching view video section. So many of you have written to me saying, Father, I found you this last year because these videos popped up on my YouTube feed. So if you are on YouTube, please hit subscribe and notifications so when a new video comes out, you can see it. It's awesome. And because you can help evangelize. Father, how do I, how do I evangelize? You want to reach people? All these battles that I have online with people saying the church is the whore of Babylon and Mary, you're worshiping Mary, I have a chance to explain to them the truth now. Because of you and subscribing, that gets our video to more people and the more people who see it, whether they're Catholic or not, I welcome it. Because that way, those non-Catholics might see something of the Catholic church they never saw before. That's incredible. 
Think of the power that we have now today to evangelize in a whole new way. Thanks to Brother Mark and Father Kaz's support and, and, and the Marian Fathers bringing you this message of Marian mercy. Wow. Whew. All right, you stayed with me. God bless you. And know that you are in our prayers. And thank you on behalf of my mom again. I can't thank you enough. I love my mom. And my mom is just so thankful for all of your prayers. She's hanging in there, praise God. And prayers for you, for your loved ones, any suffering you're going through or your loved ones are going through. I pray for our Marian helpers every single day. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen, and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Father Chris Aylar, and I'm excited to tell you about the completion of my newest project. It's been a long time in the making. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy, my new book from Marian Press that finally in one place, I feel, gives you the, all the answers of everything you need to know about God's divine mercy. In fact, it answers what is divine mercy? Who is St. Faustina? And what message did God give her for the world? How about the Feast of Divine Mercy? And what do you have to do to receive the graces that Jesus promises on this one day of the year? We talk about the meaning of the image and how to pray the novena and how to understand the chaplet and what to do with the hour of mercy and much, much more. Answering questions like, why would a merciful God allow such suffering? So please, we hope that you'll pick up a copy of this book for you and your loved ones, because if you get the understanding of what God's mercy is, you will understand why Jesus said it's mankind's last hope of salvation. So please visit us at shopmercy.org or give us a call at 800-462-7426. Thank you, and may Almighty God bless you. Why be a Marian helper? Because we Marian fathers celebrate a mass for you and all our members each and every day. You can share in all the prayers, good works, and merits of all the Marian priests and brothers around the world. And now you can share the graces just as if you were a Marian priest or brother. Every All Souls Day, we see a mass for all the deceased members of the Association of Marian Helpers. Again, there's no way that after we die, we can help ourselves, but we have to rely on the prayers of those here on earth. And we members of the Marian Fathers will be praying for you as a deceased member of our association. You can share in the graces of the perpetual novena to the divine mercy. Remember Jesus told St. Faustina that the chaplet of divine mercy is one of the most powerful prayers we can make. And every day here at the shrine of divine mercy, we pray it and you can share in those graces. So if you have any questions or you want to learn more how to be a Marian helper, please visit micprayers.com or call 1-800-462-7426 and let me personally pray for you and your loved ones. Thank you and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.